Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan M.S. Pierce and another Jonathan. This is a confluence of uh, Jonathans coming together to deliver some content for you regarding the Ukraine war and this may well go out on Silicon Curtain, I don't know, but welcome to my guest uh, Jonathan. Jonathan Fink, uh, thank you for agreeing to do this first of all. You're, um, let's bring it up actually, you're here we go. Your channel is one that I absolutely love. And we were just talking before we came on about how we don't have time to read enough at the moment because we're we're busy with our jobs and busy creating content. I am so busy creating content that I don't have enough time to watch other people's content. And yours is the one channel that I most want to watch more content of. Uh, and I think it's testament to the fantastic work you do. Would you like to introduce yourself to, uh, to the viewers who, who might not know you? Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, it's very kind of you to to say so. Um, it's a relatively new channel, and I'm relatively new to this whole kind of thing as well. Um, so the channel, first of all, I mean, that started, uh, I started planning it the day of the full-scale invasion uh, last year. Um, and I joined Twitter, so I, I hadn't really bothered with uh, that platform prior to the full-scale invasion. But um, I, I created a Twitter account, and I tried to seek out uh, who's talking about the war? Who's saying things that are sensible? Who is echoing Russian propaganda narratives? Who is doing very, you know, badly structured hot takes on it? And Twitter turned to be quite a, turned out to be quite a, a good platform to, to do that. The channel got going in April of last year. And of course, it's slow going. You know, I had to teach myself uh, how to plan and prepare for the interviews, how to reach out and try and get guests and do all the planning. And then there's the editing, publishing, setting up YouTube. There's a whole set of things to learn. Um, I say fortunately or for my sins, my day job is is marketing, uh, digital marketing. So there's a little bit of skills there that help. Um, we'll probably come to that later, but it also helps perhaps getting into the head of digital propaganda as well. As essentially my day job is commercial propaganda. And my... Uh, <laughs> nice. My, I, you know, I... I <laughs> I put my back cape on in the evenings. I do anti-propaganda. That's kind of how I see it. Actually, this is something I did did want to talk a lot about. I think it's so important in this. It, the whole, oh, I, I don't want to jump the gun, but winning on the battlefield is a precursor to winning in the information space, in my opinion. But but that that's a whole other can of ones we'll, we'll come to. Uh, why Why is it? that the Ukraine war particularly speaks to you? Why, why your obsession? Uh, I mean, I've got my own answer for this. I am obsessed with the Ukraine war to like an unhealthy degree. But why is it for you? What What is it about this one? Well, for, for me, it's always been, um, <clears throat> I've always been fascinated by Russia. Um, and uh, not from the perspective of the sort of, uh, you know, the rose tinted spectacles kind of thing. Because um, a lot of Russianists, I think have an unhealthy, uh, unhealthy love of the place. Yeah, dare I say it, and not enough fear, uh, um, um, and and that's sort of changing amongst some of them, of course, and some of them have been extraordinarily brave in in facing up to, uh, you know, what Russia is, and uh, have become extraordinary truth tellers. One in particular stands out, you know, Jade, Jade McGlynn, extraordinary writer. And it's searingly honest uh, sort of analysis of, of of Russia and its pathologies. Now, I was always fascinated by Russia from the age of about 14 onwards um, and uh, studied its history at GCSC and then A-level and then went on in university to do Russian language, literature and history. Wow. Um, for me, it was kind of fascinating because i always felt the literature dealt with big themes you know whether you like them or not it does deal with with big themes and it i always thought of it and especially when i went to russia the first time it seemed to me a little bit like a like a patient you know on the slab and you've got everything opened up you can see the mechanisms and how it works whereas in english literature everything's far more subtle far more implied it's far more about sort of I won't say superficiality, but it's about the, you know, the meta meta les of, uh, you know, sensibility, morality, behaviors, and so on. What it doesn't tell you is how those evolved, how those came about. It doesn't tell you anything about the dysfunctionality 
uh, or functionality beneath the surface. So I was drawn that's to a really, that's a really interesting observation. I never really thought about that. I, I like the idea that we kind of understand the mechanisms at play in it, within Russia, because maybe through the lens of popular culture. So wondering how accurate that might be. But it's, it's the understanding that, that we know how it works. But actually, we kind of take for granted how our own democratic institutions work and actually what's going on behind those closed doors and in those smoky rooms. And it has an interesting juxtaposition there. Sorry, and and culture and behavior. I mean, people like to talk about abstracts and they like to talk about terminology. I came to sort of think that actually a lot of what makes our institutions and our behaviors and even our freedoms is not so much about sort of people consciously um, adopting certain things and getting to grips with the written word and concept. It's about an inheritance of behaviors and the ability to transmit behaviors and cultures, culture of law um you know culture of of democratic behavior a lot of it which is which is unwritten and it relies on obviously past generations to evolve those behaviors and constantly question them but also inheritance of those behaviors from one generation to another and that's extremely i think fascinating and what i came to realize in russian history is that the inheritance mechanism is kind of broken because every regime, every generation seems to wipe out whatever progress might have been made uh, through previous generations. And only the uh, only the bad behaviors seem to be transmitted, uh, you know, with 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 fewer errors taking place in the uh, in the sort of social DNA. That's that. So this is really fascinating because, oh, my goodness goodness me we can have a 10-hour conversation here jonathan and i know we're, we've got to keep it to an hour but uh, maybe if, if if you'd be up for coming back again because already I, there's so much i want to talk about right so this idea of cultural behavior is really interesting because there are so many times that people on either threads of of my videos or out in the information space talk about like Russians are this, Russians are that, Russians are liars. There, there is corruption that's hard baked. You can't change the, the the DNA of the Russians. They are like this. And sometimes I go along with that. And sometimes I really question that because I think, is, is that the case? Can we tar entire nations with a very broad brush uh, a, a, and often a negative brush? I mean, what are your thoughts on, on that? Hmm. I know you've just kind of been speaking to that. No, we absolutely cannot. And that glosses over uh, some incredible complexities beneath the surface. Um, and, and I think some interesting mechanisms that aren't really explored. I mean, if anyone is really fascinated by the, the, the differences and the different reasons why people would support Putin's regime, then Jay McGlynn's Russian, Russia's war is an incredibly nuanced study. But I think we have to look at it that actually there is no single Russia um, there are multiple nationalities uh, within that territory. It's a huge multinational empire. In fact, you could say that there is no Russian nation as such. There is a Russian state, um, and there are certain myths and tropes associated with Russia. There is a canon of literature. Um, it just so happens that a lot of the more imperial stuff um, gets kept in, a lot of the stuff that challenges uh, centralist statist imperial narratives kind of gets left out so you've got a, you've got a, you've got a you've got an identity not built up from the ground up organically you've got one that is essentially crafted and imposed from the top down by people who are colluding in an imperialist identity but what you don't have is the russian nation and i think this is where we we kind of go wrong we we think of russia as being a uh nation state entity a little like you know, we are, uh, and we think that it came about through similar processes um, that gave rise to Britain, France, etc. But this is absolutely not the case. Russia is a, an imperial entity that owes its origins to Muscovy, um, and a lot of its identity is borrowed, stolen, and crafted or coerced into existence, uh, really at the behest of power or in the interests of power and the expanding empire. If you look at Russians themselves, you have huge differences, even from one generation to another. You have differences between regions, differences between genders. You even have differences in the same 
town streets, apartment buildings, families, people who have a, a radically different interpretation even of recent history. Um, one good example there would be, you know, different generations of emigration. Um, you speak to them and you realize that their entire worldview and view of Russia itself are different. You know, if you emigrated um, as, uh, let's say, the descendants of people who emigrated straight off the revolution, they, they, they've, they've got a very different culture to people who would have emigrated in the 70s they in turn would be different from the people emigrating in the 90s and i would imagine they probably are quite different from uh, many of the diaspora who have now been sort of forced to leave uh from uh, the country um in in the current wave what we'll probably find is again the generation who are now in school um whatever happens in future we'll find they have a very different uh, take on Russianness, politics, worldview, reality, everything, um, than people say who had their formative experience in the 90s. And a lot of it is reflective of the interests of power and the kind of propaganda and narratives that are being, um, you know, layered down at this point. Not, not least because, of course, there's a mass move to brainwash uh, children within the education system that that has somewhat changed since the beginning of the war as a reaction to the war and that which is going on uh, mm. is it's really interesting what what do you think about um i mean you've touched on narratives there and internal I ideas of who people are that there's a sense that I get that there's this endemic delusion within Russia because they have been victim to their own uh, propagandist state TV narratives uh, for so many decades that their sense of who they are is, I, I would argue, largely deluded. But also there's this endemic um, disenfranchisement where they have been for so long under political structures and regimes that do not give them power that you know from from 1917 through to 1991 they had no no democratic power and then they dabbled with democratic power and it went wrong and es essentially it got rejected not that they rejected it it kind of got rejected by really maybe the oligarchy or or putin uh, and and well eventually putin and then Putin has created these systems that are then anti-democratic so that it is now effectively a dictatorship so that you've now got generations of people who who have never experienced proper democracy and so they don't know how to do democracy so they 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 don't have the motivation to fight for democracy because they've never experienced it so there's a long like ramble there what what are your thoughts on that uh, i think that partly uh, there is definitely truth in that um but again, I think there is complexity beneath the surface there. I think after 2012 and the Bolodna protest, so that's the last large scale protest in Russia, I think you started to get a generation of younger people who were actually far more engaged in politics than any of the generations that preceded them. Except that, you know, if you have to, you have to go back just before the revolution to see the last sort of, uh, I would say, um, you know, broad engagement in politics of different kinds uh, from 1905 through to, to 1917, uh, and, and some of the emergence of what could be called a sort of civic society, I actually started to see some positive signs of that. Um, whatever cynicism people might have about Navalny and his, his motives, what is clear is that it's a fairly brave move going back and, and knowing what's going to happen to you. Mm. But also, he did... He was able to create uh, a fairly slick informational machine, and he was able to uh, create and inspire a lot of young people to get involved in becoming election observers and, uh, you know, having some kind of political agitation and involvement. Now, that might not have reached a threshold point to allow a Maidan-style event. In fact, it's probably very, very far from that. And um, Russian civic society is, or was before it's recently snuffed out, um, was far, far, far behind U Ukrainian civic uh, development and, uh, you know, that sense of agency and stuff you talked about. But it wasn't non-existent. You know, there was, there was a basis there to, to build upon. Um, 
And it was quite heartening. If you take the generation of the 90s, the people that I interacted with, they consume information. And this is where Naval and his team are, are very effective. They've created uh, really powerful media machines uh, in the diaspora. They're very good at creating, um, you know, Ukrainians aren't really going to like me saying this. They actually are rather good at crafting information, quite yeah. a lot of which is is of high quality. And it's, it's intense and it's detailed. Uh, sometimes the tone and narratives aren't quite right, but there are some extraordinary professionals at work there. And they do have a lot of traction. You know, they get millions upon millions of views per week for this diaspora uh, media machine. And I listen to a lot of that material. And a lot of, I, I tend not to listen to a huge amount of uh, Western media to help inform my channel. I do my day job. And in the background, I have a lot of material playing, uh, typically in Russian, because that oh. material is so much closer to primary sources, so much more concentrated. And the analysis uh, just feels to me... Uh, far closer has it actually has far fewer assumptions uh, or or assumptive thinking that you get in a lot of western media so for me that is like a concentrated information bomb and i listen to uh, ukrainian uh, channels as well um so that's can interesting you speak, can, and you speak ukrainian? Ukrainian. Hmm? can you speak ukrainian i cannot speak ukrainian but quite a lot of the ukrainian uh, media output is still in uh, yeah. ukrainian and russian so you'll often get interviewers asking questions in Ukrainian, and then you'll have experts, either Russian or Ukrainian experts, responding in Russian. You also have Mikhail Podolyak and many other senior uh, members of the Ukrainian government uh, who do a lot of interviews in Russian to try and reach out to Russian-speaking audiences within Ukraine and uh, to Russians themselves. Um, so it's a great, a great source of information. Now, this is the really interesting part, I think, is that so you have a lot of Russians, especially in the diaspora, who are listening to a huge amount of concentrated information and therefore have a rare, a fairly good idea in many cases what's happening in Russia, the levels of repression and what's going on on the front lines. Information, it turns out, though, is not activism. And that generation of the 90s were radically cynical and divorced from politics. They were liberated to try and go and earn money and upskill themselves and you know, do up their flats and houses and they had certain material ambitions. But it wasn't even the case that the elite stole politics and democracy from them. They were radically disenfranchised and uninterested. And they were already in the 90s deeply, deeply cynical about the efficacy of any political process. Um, and I think that was, that's the interesting thing. It's the younger people who were in their sort of, late teens and 20s in 2012 and beyond that started to finally kick off this idea that uh, that 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 politics is completely ineffective and, and and can't form part of your life and that was incredibly encouraging it just so happened of course that that coincided with the period of the intensification of uh, the move from the sort of hybrid autocracy to uh, a more blatant uh, autocracy yeah, and it, it, I guess it, that's possibly a result of the internet age where the young people can see how politics works in other places in real time and, and speak to people in ways that they could never have done in previous decades. And and I guess that that, that would give them ammunition and, and ideas and ideology to, to challenge the status quo. But then, you know, when Russia has more members of internal security than they do of the armed forces, you know, any kind of dissent is quickly quashed, which is which is an absolute uh, it's actually mm. shame, of course. Uh, moving the conversation completely left field, uh, I, I was watching one of your interviews the other night, uh, Alexander Motil, I mm -hmm. believe, and he had some really interesting, because I've been I'm not a conspiracy thinker, right? I am a I'm a philosopher uh, that and I, I usually am a philosopher of religion, so I'm arguing about whether God exists or not, right? And and that and what morality is and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but but it's basically evidence based thinking is my thing, and so I shy away from very dubious uh, kind of conspiratorial thinking. But the idea that Putin has body doubles and the idea that Putin has even died is something that I think is actually very plausible having looked at pictures of putin myself and saying no these to me these are two at least two different people 
And then when Alexander Mottel came on and, and really gave a great summary of of the situation, you know, it it, it rang a lot of bells that that, that rang true for me. Uh, so I think it is it is probable that Putin has body doubles, almost certain actually. And the the rumors that came out recently that Putin has died, and then some of the things that he brought to bear in 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 that kind of area made me think. Well, really, he he could well have died, and we are seeing a lot of a body double. And who is the real Putin anymore? Do we know? Yes. What what are your thoughts on all of that? Well, I think I think uh, some of the audience took took that video. Um, incredibly literally and i think but i think what alexander because alexander is also uh, as well as being an academic and a historian he's also an artist and there's a certain amount of uh dare i say it um not so much satire but there's a certain amount of playfulness um in his personality um despite you know the fairly straight delivery i kind of think we were having a little bit of fun there because i don't think either of us really believe that putin has died um, mm. And the trigger for it, however, was not the speculation so much about the doubles, because I think that, that goes without saying um, he clearly does, and many mm. dictators in the past have had doubles. Um, I think it's a fairly well-understood process. And seeing Putin, on the one hand, in some films, you know, 10 metres away from even his closest associates, and in other clips taken where he's not really doing any speaking, but he's up close and personal with crowds and embracing them, that... It's highly plausible that it's a double. Yeah, I mean, there's not so much the physical differences, but the behavioural yeah. differences that I think are, yeah. are really good indicators. Yeah, but yeah. Well, there are both. There are physical differences and behaviour. Well, I think yeah. what we were playing with is that actually Russian history and Russian literature is replete with extreme absurdity. You know, if you think of the novels of uh, Nikolai Gogol, okay, he's Ukrainian. You put that out there before anyone gets upset. But he was writing... Uh, his novels and a lot of his short stories were written and formed by that atmosphere of surreal absurdity, almost sort of magical realism that you get from the imperial capital, St. Petersburg. Um, and there are many other instances in Russian literature of extreme absurdity. Um, you know, there's, um, was it, uh, is it Lieutenant Kije is another one when opera was made? Um, from that, I think, by Prokofiev. Someone's going to tell me I'm completely wrong there. But again, it's the idea that there's a senior armor officer or somebody that uh, that's totally fictitious. He doesn't exist. And yet everyone pretends that he is, you know. So there's extreme absurdity in, in Russian history. And I think absurdity comes with the territory of autocracy as well. If you think of um, Armando Iannucci's Death of Stalin film, mm. um, reality in Russia turns out to be so much more absurd than fiction could ever dare to put on celluloid or put into words. Um, so I think we were having a little bit of fun there because when Putin does snuff it, and when we do learn of what's gone on behind the scenes, we'll find it so much madder than anyone could possibly have, uh, you know, predicted or or analysed with their, you know, rational geopolitical hats on. Well, it was interesting that he was saying that there, you know, Patricia had said, had given like four speeches where he normally wouldn't do any talking. And there were certain things that had been said as if the sort of things that would be put into place or or, or said as if Putin had died. And mm. it's, just, it's just interesting that it's, it's not implausible. Like we're in the realm of it could well have happened, but we just yeah. don't know who the real Putin is. And speaking yeah. of... Well, Putin, it's been advised. It's, well, been, yeah. it's been announced today that Putin is going to do his annual press conference. So it was cancelled last year, the first time in his uh, reign that he didn't do the annual press thing. And you'll see from, you'll know from watching those, they typically last about three or four hours. It's just, and, and of course, the questions aren't, you know, they don't just let anyone come in and ask questions. There's a lot of engineering that goes into those events. Nonetheless, the old Putin um, uh, was extremely, I'd say, verbally dexterous. Um, he is well-spoken to an extent, and, unless he's using crude language, which he does deploy as well to engage with his audience. Um yeah. But he is very good at thinking on his feet, and he is—he uh, has got energy previously in his press releases to keep going for many hours without any physical fatigue being apparent. Um, and it's worth noting that he doesn't speak Russian with an accent. You know, he's one of the first leaders from a long line of Soviet leaders who speaks Russian 
without either a provincial accent or a Georgian accent or whatever it happens to be, or even Ukrainian accent. And, and no one mocks his speech, his diction, his grammar, because it's considered, you know, uh, proper, proper Russian. I don't think he would announce that he's going to do this press junket if it was a double, because a double wouldn't mm. be able to sustain yeah. that. So I, I suspect he's still alive. But it, it may be the case that he's not quite as agile, not quite as fluent as he has been in previous years. Um, quite possibly, uh, you know, there is uh, maybe some kind of mental decline uh, from disease or age kicking in. Mm -hmm. I think that will become quite apparent if he does go through with this press event. Yeah. Well, speaking of, indeed, Putin, I mean, we, we have seen over the course of, of the war, I mean, my theory is that it started off as a special military operation, right? So it genuinely, genuinely was just a quick swap of, of, of government, kill Zelensky or let him run away, depose a government within three days, two weeks to clear everything up with the Rodskvardia and all this kind of carry on. Then after a couple of days, there was a realisation that, oh, we can't do that. And we don't really have a plan B. So it started off as an SMO, genuinely, and then became a war accidentally, as far as the Russians are concerned, and is still a war now where we are unsure of what Putin's mm. end goals are. Now, he cannot achieve those maximalist goals, would be my opinion. And I wrote an article back in April last year, or maybe even been February, saying... Putin can't win. Just a realization that he couldn't take Kiev. Like that wasn't going to happen. And to take the whole of the country, therefore, was impossible. And that's still the case now. He can't have those maximal objectives obtained. So, therefore, what do you think Putin's goals are now, even if he has? Do you think he even has clear goals? Or is it just, goodness me, let's keep in this for as long as we can? Because that's my only, is can, I'm existentially connected to the outcome of this war. Yeah. There, there are several things there, and I'm going to draw on some of the analysis done by Vlad Vexler and others, as well as the people I've been interviewing recently. So let's start with Putin's goals, but then we'll rewind to the invasion itself, because I think it's far more than just decapitating a regime. And there are very concerning evidences emerging that actually it's far more pernicious and dark than, than that. Mm. Um, but let's turn to it. So what's he doing at the moment? Well, First of all, his regime hasn't been toppled. Hundreds of thousands of Russians have died. And the Western media is still stuck in the narrative that Russians are suffering for this, uh, that sanctions are biting and blah, blah, blah. That may be true for the urban elite and for the hundreds of thousands who've had to flee the country, the sort of proto-middle class. Putin doesn't care about those. If people have stayed, either, and we're talking about the big urban centres here, either it's because they're prepared to tolerate the pain and the inconvenience um, for some kind of benefits, or simply they don't want to move abroad, and etc. Or, and this is this is the more worrying one, people are staying because they are benefiting from the war economy. And there is ample evidence now that there is certainly the elite in the large cities who have managed to increase their salaries. As, as bunches of people left, as experts left, those who remained are able to charge more for their services. I mean, that's just basic uh, economics going on there. It's also fueled by a number of Western companies who are still operating in country and paying decent salaries. Um, you know, I don't want, don't want to get your show sued, um, but there are lists produced by the Financial Times and others, and it includes some of the biggest corporate names in the world. It's disgusting and, and disgraceful, but they are helping to keep, um, you know, a big segment of the educated, uh, skilled society there. If you look at the provinces, <coughs> if you look at the provinces, the picture is 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 more terrifying and that is that there has never been as much money sloshing around in the russian provinces as there is now people are getting money in lieu of their dead relatives they're getting cars and refrigerators and sacks of potatoes and fish in lieu of their dead husbands for many of them they're probably rid not just of a father and whatever they're rid of a rid of a drunkard who, who beat them and now they've got some material benefit and they've got rid of this guy. Um, 
there are whole classes of people who are in prison who are criminals and whose families would have been looked down upon uh, in the villages and towns where they where they resided. Their relatives joined the army, joined Wagner, got killed, whatever. Some of them have even returned home. This is the irony, is that there are articles suggesting that the Wagner war criminals who have served their time, some of them are being allowed to return home to their villages. Imagine that, murderers, rapists, abusers. And they're not just returning to their villages with more cash, cash in their pockets. They're returning with medals on their chest. They're returned as heroes. And people in those villages dare not speak out uh, for the terror that might be meted out to them, not just by these criminals themselves, but now by the official structures who, who give them shelter uh, and, and, and some kind of cachet and status. So there's an extraordinary situation there. I mean, those uh, people in the Falafang villages and provinces would never have seen as much money as is being showered on them. Um, now, to support this operation, this military operation, you also have a huge military industrial complex. Uh, a lot of that money that would have gone into oligarchs' pockets would have ended up in Moscow, is now being distributed more equitably as the country turns into a war economy. You have propagandists making money hand over fist. You have tens of thousands of people working in the propaganda industries uh, who are now essentially hooked into this war economy. So, so you're essentially you're saying that the war has pre presented an opportunity for an actually a more equitable redistribution of wealth. That, that actually this is a kind of economic reform that, that, that the country desperately needed. Um, it, it's not going to last. You know, what do people do with that money? Well, you know, if it's in the hands of, uh, of the women rather than the drunkard husbands, then maybe they'll do something useful with it. But no, I mean, it's certainly for now, at least, um, this is a process that allows society to be far more stable than it ought to be. Now, I don't think this is necessarily um, sustainable. Uh, because if you invest in the war economy, you're not investing in the productive economy. So that that can't go on forever. Um, and of course, on a macro level, the economy is not, not such a great state. You've got rampant inflation. Um, and as I say, a lot of money, a huge chunk of the budget, and it's increasing is going to go in towards the war economy rather than uh, the sort of consumer economy. It's not being invested in infrastructure and so on. So it's not all and I'm not saying it's all rosy or this is, you know, this is a kind of reform, but it's enough to keep people quiet. It's enough to create the illusion of stability. Um, and all those people who are likely to have protested against the regime have been forced out of the country or have gone underground uh, because they're terrified. So in some ways, Putin's sitting there thinking, well, hang on a second. We can't go back to a peacetime economy because all this stuff would, would, would fly apart, right? And, and people who suddenly have a, a slightly better material existence, that would be taken away. That's a really, it's a really dangerous point. So the simple answer, I'll give you a long rambling answer. The simple answer is Putin's survival depends on the war, not just reputationally, which is what a lot of the Western media focuses on, but the entire economy, social structure, and structure of coercion is almost dependent on the war continuing a forever war yeah this is something i've talked about recently so i've i've uh, done whole videos, just separate videos on that Putin is existentially linked to the outcome of this war and so therefore y ukraine can't win the war and Putin remains in power so uh, if that outcome mm -hmm. took place i think one way or another you'd see the end of Putin and i think he mm -hmm. knows that and so therefore it is he will make decisions that might not seem rational to other people. He might not seem like a rational actor, but when you understand in the context of his existential future being linked to the outcome of the war, then you start understanding why he might make these decisions. But it's interesting as well what you say. It goes beyond that to to this other these other linkages. To the, it's interesting that of course. The, the, the people who would have been against the war at the beginning of the war, the Russians, fled the country or were imprisoned in gulags or prison or whatever. Mm. And indeed, might have even been sent to the front line uh, as well. And so what you have left uh, 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 is an obsequious population that are 
prepared to just go along with it's almost like you're whittling the population down to just your yes men uh, and then still feeding them the state propagandist narratives from the tv channels that he's creating this this whole kind of entity russian entity that that won't do much no matter what decision he kind of makes and it's yeah interesting I don't know. And I'm that's not a process that started with Putin, let's face it. I mean, the the most active and dynamic uh, and creative classes in society, um, many of them were, were executed in, in the 1930s or, you know, died in the Civil War or were pushed out of the country. So this seems to happen generation after generation. Just as soon as you start to evolve a crop of people who start to think independently uh, or, or or be independent of the state you know somebody else comes along or, or the regime reaches a certain point in its life where these people are um no longer a benefit they're a disbenefit and a threat um and so this is a generational process of of culling people with agency um let's turn back though to this this point about the invasion because yes i think they did have a simplistic plan to take Kiev in 10 days. They did believe, I think, that uh, uh, not only is Zelensky a sort of puppet regime, they almost certainly believed that because he's Jewish, etc., that he wouldn't have the support of the mass of Ukraine's uh, population. I don't think Putin and his acolytes really even think of people as having agency. They don't believe in democracy and politics. They only believe in conspiracy and coercion. And that's absolutely clear from their actions. So they were expecting to decapitate the regime. But I think it's far more problematic than just that, because evidence is now emerging that they had a massive kill list, that they took a huge number of body bags. And you have to ask, well, who is this for? They almost certainly would have had a list of anybody involved in politics, anybody involved in local administration, civil society, cultural leaders, teachers, creators, artists. They would have all those who didn't agree to, to go into silence or change their tune and agree to be russified. They would have committed genocide against. I think it's quite clear that that's what have happened. Every Ukrainian who is part of the intelligentsia or artistic community or civil society knows instinctively and from evidence that they would not have survived the occupation that's incredibly chilling and and you can actually add to that i mean news out today i reported in in my news video this morning that uh the russians were putting in place a, a kind of holodomor part two with regard to creating or or they had bought themselves some really big grain containers for the export of grain the idea that they were just going to steal very much like the 1930s going to steal grain from ukraine for their own kind of centralized benefit that that would I, I guess leave them vulnerable to being, or Putin vulnerable to being accused of of committing yet another huge war crime. Yeah, it's, yeah it really is absolutely. pretty, uh, pretty t terrible. Yeah, yeah. The only the only thing that has uh, that prevents him acting, there's no moral uh, barrier. Uh, is 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 the physical incapability? You know, it's the limitation of his armed forces, the limitation of his ability to project power. Mm. That's the only limitation on, on, on the bad things that he does. Which, which you know, shooting himself in the foot, of course, he he's, that limit is even more constrictive now, given that he's basically destroyed his own army. I mean, yes, they might be able to eke out some kind of long-lasting stalemate in in ukraine but essentially that's the end of his army for a generation uh there, there's no way they can commit internationally to any other uh conflict in a meaningful way it's just like every metric i look at whether this was a good decision for putin it wasn't like russia are not in a position they were five years ago by any stretch of the imagination and they're not going to be there for another decade i mean it it, it it seems to me and i'd be interested if you agree that this is a one of the 
the worst geopolitical decisions i mean hindsight's obviously 2020 right but one of the worst geopolitical decisions i I guess maybe even ever, like taking like, where Russia could have gone and where it might might have been, but to where it's going to be for the next 10, 20 years, it seems terrible. It, it does. And I think I think those poor decisions go back uh, far further than that. I mean, 2012, when up until that point, you could argue that uh, there were tremendous changes, positive changes happening in Russian society. Now, that's not to exonerate Putin. Uh, to my view, he's always been a dictator. And in fact, uh, you know, one video that's not live on the channel yet, um, my guest describes Yeltsin as an authoritarian. So he's another authoritarian and a long line of authoritarians. But mm. if you look at the uh, the longevity rate, and if you look at certain metrics around sort of material comfort, m more so obviously in the big cities, but generally the, the survivability rate um, or longevity rate was going up dramatically. Uh, it, it really crashed in the 90s. The Soviet Union uh, actually had, uh, even though its healthcare wasn't brilliant, um, it was able to steadily improve life expectancy. Um, and, and then it crashed in the 90s during the sort of chaos, alcoholism, and and uh, I would say, uh, you know, lowering of nutrition and so on there. Uh, and then it, then it dramatically increased in that first half of, of Putin's reign. So whatever... You might want to comment on his um, political repressions. Materially, um, Russia was improving, and there's no yeah. No and and I'm going to add an anecdote to that. So I I've got progressive multiple sclerosis, and when I was diagnosed with that in 2018, back end of 2018, there was no uh, treatment for that in the UK. No no drug treatment because it's a it's a I, it's a progressive type of the the. Um, of MS that I have, and most people have the, the kind of normal up and down type, which there are loads of drug treatments. Anyway, I looked into it and it and I went and had stem cell treatment. And I had that in Moscow because it was the best place in the world for it. The team was amazing. I did heaps of research and uh, fantastic. So I did a whole load of fundraising, went to Moscow and was a month in a, in a fabulous um, hospital with an incredibly good treatment. And my MS has, has broadly stabilized since then, which is absolutely fantastic. But speaking to Russians, so in the three three days before my treatment started, where you're still doing bits and pieces, I, I got mm -hmm. to go around Moscow a bit and speak to, you know, speak to drivers who are driving us around, showing us the different places. And it's like, it's so much better now. There's no crime compared to the 90s. You know, real, real, like I had a real critical understanding of Putin then in 2019. And yet he was, he was a Russian saying, no, I, I'm, I'm fully on board with the kind of reforms that have been made and had a really generally positive outlook. And that he wasn't the only one. So it's interesting to get that idea but of course that's very moscow centric doesn't talk about what's going on in baratia or or kamchatka or wherever so there there are obviously different elements to to how successful putin has been as a leader yes and of course it's the age-old thing where a lot of resources really were concentrated uh, in moscow in the center to take a more provincial view i travel to a place called verkota if there's any russians watching this um very few Russians have been to that place. It's uh, it's uh, in the far north. It's about, I think, um, a couple of hundred kilometers above the Arctic Circle. And it was a town of several hundred thousand people created by political prisoners in the 1930s. Um, the main industries there, I think, are coal and rocketry. Um, and it's an extraordinary place with nine months of snow cover uh, in, in, the, uh, in the sort of May period. You'll have... Uh, snow blizzards and white nights at the same time so the sun kind of does that in the sky yeah. it never gets dark but you've got these you know it, it's an extraordinary place extraordinary that anyone wants to live there certainly in those kind of volumes of people but when i went there it was right at the start when a lot of people were leaving some were emigrating to israel some were coming to uh you know central russia people were leaving because wages weren't being paid but it did have I would say the atmosphere of a Soviet city. It was relatively clean. In fact, it was very clean. The apartment buildings were not great, but they you know weren't that dilapidated either. Um, shops had stuff in them, cakes and food and whatever. And on top of the buildings, you had the old neon signs, um, glory to labor, all this sort of stuff. Um, so that town actually was far more, in my impression, orderly 
and tidy. And, uh, and of course, all those old Soviet slogans had long disappeared from Moscow and St. Petersburg. It was almost like stepping back into a little time warp. And you came to realize that, okay, the Soviet Union, not brilliant on many, many levels. Um, but at the same time, you know, certain cities would have been relatively well looked after. And despite the shortages, uh, people had apartments and whatever. And, uh, you know, people would have had certain amounts of sort of furniture and a, a style of life which wasn't the worst. And that's not to say everybody lived like that. But, you know, there, there, there were certain reasons why people are nostalgic for the Soviet Union. I've recently watched videos of that same city. Now, it's an absolute, you know, it's a Mad Max wasteland of yeah. abandoned buildings. Wow. There's, there's even suburbs where an apartment building will catch fire and just burn and no one will do anything about it because it's, you know, there might Gee. be some tramps and whatever living in there, but essentially you've got whole districts of the town just abandoned and rotting uh, into the earth. And um, it's extraordinary. And that that would be repeated in many, many provincial towns around the country. So whereas the standard of living and the prospects might be higher in Moscow than they were in the 90s, in many towns, they could be far, far worse with the depopulation, hopelessness, alcoholism and the general abandonment of those settlements by the government. I suppose it's almost like an analogue of oligarchy, which is money concentrates in very few areas uh, and it concentrates an awful lot. And, you know, you can say that about Moscow. You can say that about St. Petersburg. I'm just going to take this opportunity, if I can, Jonathan, to and thank you for this incredible, generous super chat from SR USA 54. It's insane. Thank you. Uh, thank you, as always, Jonathan. I just finished the first two volumes of Stephen Kotkin's biography of Stalin. It is a commitment, as each volume is approximately a thousand pages, but it's worth the effort. Uh, Jonathan here is, is nodding his head. I don't know if he's read it, but, uh, it, you know, I, I, Kotkin's an interesting one. Politically, I wouldn't be massively aligned to him, but he does have some really interesting and things to say about Russia that I think are on the money. Um, mm. So thank you. Oh, I'd love to have on the channel. I mean, I, I, I it, weekly I get someone putting a comment in the video saying, you've got to have him on the channel. Some people are incredibly difficult to reach. Um, you know, people like Timothy Schneider. Yes, Kotkin, I mean, I would, uh, that would be my dream yeah. was to speak to Timothy Schneider. That would be something else. You know, I've got a few Ukrainians. I mean, Zelensky would be fabulous. Um <laughs> No, worries. Anna yeah, Baum easy. is another one I'd love to speak yes. to. Yes, oh, I mean, Twilight of Democracy is such a good book. Yeah, uh, and yeah, uh, I I have ambitions, and, and I actually have uh, a certain amount of optimism that eventually I will get my entire hit list on the channel. I think what's m even more interesting, perhaps, is who I wouldn't be inviting on, and you know, many people. Uh, uh, someone says, uh, "Slava Ukraini, Khorem Slava." Um, well, so thanks to Jonathan and Jonathan for all you do for our community. I like that because, and thank you, Paul, by the way. But um, I like it's the our community. It's not my community, your community. But mm. it's almost like this this kind of morally, politically pro-Ukrainian community. Anyway, th thanks, Paul. But carry on, Jonathan. No, it's good. I think with with uh, NAFO, um, if there's any fellas kind of watching this, um, I think uh, yeah, no, it does feel like a community. It does feel like. Uh, um, despite the last couple of years of, of, of really sort of partisan um, politics in the US and the UK, what's nice on the channel is people who are, you know, GOP, Democrat, conservative, Labour, Lib Dem, etc. Everyone seems to be able to align and find some common ground in the support for Ukraine and also what Ukraine does, which is catalyze us to think about our values, the risks to our democracy, the fragility of that, and of course, you know, the mechanics of these uh, authoritarian rise. So I think that, that's an incredibly important bit. It's, I think the think interesting bit what, is people. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, is that what dr partly drives you? Because I know what drives me is my strong sense of morality here. And I know it's simplistic, but I really do think it's obvious that the Ukrainians are the good guys, the Russians are the bad guys, both politically and in terms of like the people you see fighting this war. And I know the eyes are on the Ukrainians, so they're having to do things by the book. Uh, so there's that kind of, there's that utilitarian ideal to why they're being like, morally upstanding in the way they're pr prosecuting the war but also i just think it's part of you know they just morally it seems obvious that they're the good guys now i know there's issues yeah. with corruption and i know that's that is simplistic but it speaks to me is is that something that you find 
It is, and, and but the reason, I mean, that that would be enough to sustain me as a supporter of Ukraine, doing you know activism, and so on. I don't think it's enough to sustain me doing the entire channel, and I don't think the good guys, bad guys argument. I mean, it's definitely true. It's the least morally ambiguous war since mm. the Second World War. That's not enough to actually swing the pendulum uh, for us to fully support Ukraine. We have to mm. find other rationales for why we're doing this. For me. It was coming from the point of view of marketing and having an interest in digital propaganda, having done literature and language as well. I, I, I like a, a sort of close analysis of texts. And I don't just take words as sort of fuzzy things, imparting whatever meaning you want. I look at texts as telling you something about the speaker, and I take the words used incredibly seriously um, and, and sort of deconstruct them in that way. Therefore, for me, what I could see or what I started to see in what Ukrainians were doing is developing methodologies and techniques and stories um, that were making them resilient against aggression on multiple fronts. And so for me is the idea that they're innovating and that innovating is ensuring their survival and the, the flowering of their democratic institutions, whereas we seem to be on the opposite path where we're having a degradation of our democratic discourse and institutions so mm. for me it was like yes mm. ukraine needs to survive but it also needs to survive because it's a bit like biodiversity it's the kind of demographic uh, democratic diversity we need they've discovered or they're experimenting with techniques and behaviors which if we don't do the same and if we don't learn from them mm. we, we could lose our values so important. I, I, democratic backsliding. Two things you talk about there are, are, are two of the things that I find insanely important. And I, I've got like goosebumps. Uh, <laughs> like that's how much it means to me. Like democratic backsliding. And I look at places like uh, uh, All Bands Hungry. And I look at the US. And I look at even uh, in a, even our own country, the UK, with elements of, of democratic backsliding of certain media organizations having like overrepresentation and i think that, that there is a fight to get a fee, free and fair democracy and when you look at ukraine who has that as their ideal and one of the things they're fighting for we can learn from them it's like yeah this is who we should want to be and where we should want to go to just as much but i just what you said this is why i love this com conversations like this jonathan because open up all these big ideas you talked about stories there and i've never thought about this but when I am surveying Twitter, like you, I mean, this was, I, I was on Twitter, but I wasn't really, this war, I, I found Twitter insanely useful, even though I have a great dislike for Elon Musk. But Twitter as a, an aggregator of all these sources is, is, is an amazing resource. But I am consistently seeing stories about people, about events, about Ukrainians, where I'm not seeing that for Russians, part, partly because I may not be looking at the right sources, but also there isn't their kind of imperial expansionism and narcissistic megalomania isn't something that makes good stories that whereas we're we are replete you know the internet is replete with incredible stories of ukrainian uh, hardship and overcoming hardship and heroism and and this and that it's just such a it's a real stark difference between the two yeah i think unfortunately it is reflective of reality of course people aren't going to want to hear too many Russian stories, but actually the press has had a Russia bias for a long time. And I don't mean here like in the way you think, not a Russophobic bias, but actually the press um, puts too much emphasis on Russia and Russian stories to the detriment historically of Ukrainian stories and other narratives. Um, I fear the reason you don't hear that many of these stories is that simply uh, the threshold of people who are engaged in this kind of stuff, in the heartwarming or civic society time stories are far, far fewer. And there was one this morning, which rightly gets attention, extraordinarily brave uh, Russian artist who was writing on supermarket labels with facts about the war. Yeah, I, I love that. Did, yeah, I mean, and the fact that she then went to, she's put in the cage as, uh, as, as in a Russian courts do, and rather than then apologizing or begging for freedom or whatever, she came out with the extraordinary phrase, I'm behind bars, but I'm freer than any of you. Oof. 
that is incredible. And she was in a nice rainbow tie dye t shirt. So it's basically a double F you to uh, you know, the values of the Russian. I haven't world. seen that. I, I know it's she'd done that, tremendous. but I hadn't seen any of that. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. The nice um, thing is Ukrainians applaud that. And Ukrainians aren't going to resent that. If they have someone who speaks out like that and puts themselves in personal danger, most Ukrainians would say, you know, they're one of us. Yeah, uh, they're Ukrainian absolutely. in spirit and, and, and applaud it. They're just a far, far too few of them. Some of the stories are just far too nuanced as well. So the founders of Memorial are uh, on trial, et cetera, and it had a little bit of coverage, but not too much. So... We could be doing more to cover the extermination of Russian civil society, and we could be doing more mm. to cover those kind of things. I try to do that in my weekly sort of news coverage and bring those sort of stories that don't get an airing in the in the Western media to the fore. Um, but I fear it's just there are many, many more Ukrainians involved in civic society than uh, the equivalent in Russia, despite it being a, a larger country. Every single watcher, viewer who is not a subscriber to Silicon Curtain, you are not allowed to exist without going and subscribing to Silicon Curtain. So go and do it, although just wait until the end of the video. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so one question, I know it's probably a little bit out of kilter with where we've just been going, but I wanted to ask it earlier, was a question, to what extent would a change in regime actually change Russian policy? So th this might talk to ideas of who is there to replace Putin. And you have a lot of people scaremongering that it will be someone that's even more ultra-nationalist than Putin, therefore we should keep Putin in charge. I'm not sure actually that that would work because even with Prigozhin, he was uh, more horrible in many ways than than Putin in in the kind of the actual tangible things he did. But he was also a realist and was very critical. And I think if he had got into power, he would have known like it wasn't there was no utility in continuing the war. And I think he would would have stopped it, even though he is more of an ultra nationalist, arguably. Anyway, expansion has always yeah. been their policy from Tsar through Comrade and now presidential. So, what are you th your thoughts there? Yeah, no, I I agree with this. I mean, policy to an extent will change but what we need to keep an eye on is and very few people are thinking about this is the generational change so policy yes the war has to end reparations have to be paid my belief actually is that the next regime in russia will be a liberal regime but nonetheless a puppet concocted by uh you know the sylvia key by the secret uh, services who essentially, you know, pull the strings, and Putin's one of their people. I suspect. Yeah, so I'm going to interrupt. Sorry. So because yep. this is something I find really interesting, but I don't know enough about it. Like it's because Putin has got rid of the people around him, and he's got a very thin pillar. Right? It's not a pyramid or a, a triangle that you might have expected in old Soviet times, where you'd have plenty of people that could replace you or whatever going down more and more. He's he's more like that, as, as I understand. He gets rid of, throws people out the window, poisons them, and put them in prison. So actually, there doesn't seem to be very many people that could threaten him. However, I don't know what's going on with the FSB. And he is comes from that stock himself, but he wasn't exactly like a major FSB guy in, in the way that others were. And so uh, do, is there a potential that there are FSB people pulling his strings? That That's that's the bit which, which we don't know. That's the bit where there is some sort of uh, you know, discussion around. I'd be, I'd be far more comfortable having someone like... Um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll send his name over in a minute, but I'd be far more comfortable having some Russian experts talking about that who have much more connections within the system. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I suspect Putin was a puppet. I mean, to an extent, you know, Napoleon was a puppet until he wasn't. Uh, so it, clearly he has developed uh, power over the years and uh, and those who put him in charge may no longer have any control over him. He also, there are uh some evidence that he has strong links to organized crime you have to wonder you know whether they are still pulling the strings as well and how far organized crime gangs really merged with the state to become one and the same thing indistinguishable so there's lots of things going on there i kind of suspect however that there will be people within the uh, sort of fsb structures who will understand that it's far too dangerous to plot to overthrow the current czar, but this won't last forever and may well be formulating the next government, the next policy. So you have to ask, well, what do they want out of that? Would they want to put an extreme nationalist in charge? And here, let's do away with any idea that the Russian people have any agency in this. 
even the Z patriots, you know, there's, there's not going to be a representative regime. It's not going to be something that organically comes about through, you know, revolution or or ground up agitation, even from the, the, the patriotic nationalists. It's something that will be imposed. And those that don't like it will be dead. Um, so my view is they'll be thinking, well, how do we get back to the gravy train that we had before? Well, they're not going to do that through a nationalist. They will only do that if they convince the West that they've changed. Therefore, a puppet liberal is far more likely. And figures like Senya Subchak, uh, Kirienka, and others may well be uh, in the wings being groomed to create Russia's next regime. Interesting. Yeah. Um, question is, do we do we fall for that? Do we let them off the hook? For me, it's less about these sort of superficial figures. It's more about whether you can bring about systemic change. And systemic change, I mean, this is, Hordakovsky has written an interesting book about this um, called How to Slay a Dragon. I'm going to do an episode on that because I think it's worth breaking it down chapter by chapter. Essentially, that entire mechanism, that entire parasitic uh, elite with the Siloviki, the Apparatchiks, um, you know, the 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 uh, you know the top managers of top enterprises, the media machine, all of this is is a parasitical entity. It doesn't create wealth; it just sucks the wealth out of the country. Where does that wealth come from? It comes from extraction industries. It doesn't come mm. from adding value to raw materials or manufacturing uh, or even dare I say agriculture. It comes from basic raw materials being sold on uh, and, and an extraction. Uh, I would I would class that as a parasitic uh, economy. Um, and if you're going to systemically change Russia and allow democracy to not just get nurtured, but then have some kind of transition from generation to generation, you have to change the entire economic model. So that not, is, not, a, yeah. not a small challenge. And, and it's so when you're thinking about where it goes next, then it, it, it's thinking about, well, what do the people who are behind the scenes really need or feel they need? What do they want? And therefore, what system has the most utility for them? I, I guess that's just a little bit of a paradigm shift where it's like, actually, I can see a liberal being put in charge there because they would be more manipulatable and would yeah. bring about money in in a far easier way than some kind of isolationist ultra nationalist uh and, well, they, and people, they, they, people love money on with the west you know and uh everything would be lovely again but the fundamental system that created the vertical autocracy hasn't changed and most yeah. of the classes of people who constitute it won't have changed and it, the fundamental and this is this is where we get back into the culture of democracy because what we don't realize i mean we have a, a system of rule of law etc but fundamentally without trust none of that would work you know none of the laws that we have on paper would work unless you had people needing to trust each other and cooperate with each other um and a complex manufacturing based economy requires rule of law and it requires trust to exist and for people not to rip each other off all the time. And Which goes back to these everything. cultural behaviours yeah. where, where yeah. there is this endemic lack of trust and you've got this Vranio where, you know, BS goes up the, the ladders of yeah. hierarchy and is just unchecked and it's just, yeah. it is part of the DNA. And of course, that would need to change, as you say. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, look, we're, we're coming towards the end of the end of the time. It's been such a, such a great conversation and so much more I want to talk about. I, re I really think there's a lot more to be said about disinformation that we, that we could invest investigate I, th I think it's such a worrying thing and like you and i are actually in some ways on the on the front lines of the battles concerning the information space and and we concern ourselves with that uh, there's lots to talk about like what would you do if the you were the u.s prime minister uh, u.s president or uk prime minister now uh, interesting about uk prime minister because we don't have oodles of 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 weapons so what would you do to support you but yeah. we're gonna have to lead that i, I guess um what so going back to what i'd asked previously but we didn't quite get there what would you think putin's objectives now we talked about like he, he he's connected to the outcome of the war but what do you think he wants what do you think he's realistically trying to achieve right now 
I'm not sure there's any strategy. I mean, there's very little evidence of a strategy. Mm -hmm. um, even the huge human meat wave attacks that we're seeing once again in Avdivka, this all seems to be strategies to get him through, you know, the next press release, get through the next anniversary, get through the next event. He's now clearly eyeing the 2024 presidential election. He needs some victories. He needs something he can talk about. Um, a little bit of red meat he can throw at the Z patriots and so on, because we know that the election is going to be falsified. Um, he just needs something to keep the propaganda machine going. I'm not sure there's anything beyond that. He yeah, may have right. deluded him. He may have deluded himself into thinking that Trump will be elected, uh, Europe and America will give up, and he can somehow roll over Ukraine. That may be because he's been given poor information uh, by his subordinates uh, or that he's completely deluded or a mixture of both. He almost certainly is waiting for something dramatic to happen to improve his position. All of this lazy media narratives about stalemate, war fatigue, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, is just so simplistic as to be worthless. And it, it, it makes me mad to hear the media trying to put labels on everything. Clearly, it's not a huge war of movement, but there's an incredible amount going on. You know, Ukraine is degrading mm. uh, the Russian army, uh, destroying vast amounts of equipment, and they have a bridgehead that they've established on the, um, on the opposite bank of the Dnipro, as well as making Crimea less and less tenable for Russia, destroying logistics and forcing Russia Black Sea Fleet out. These are all extraordinary achievements. Which so many are, metrics for success. Yeah, uh, so many metrics of success and resilience um, glossed over by the media in a, in a frankly fatuous and simplistic manner. Um, I mean, not all of them. You have some good correspondence on the ground, but I'm broadly sort of speaking here. Um, and, of course, you have this concept of war fatigue, which... Uh, one of my recent guests, Benjamin Tallis, has labelled manufactured war fatigue because it's manufactured by the political class uh, in, in the West. If you talk to mm. Ukrainians, they are tired, they're exhausted, but that's a physical thing you can recover from. They're not fatigued. How can you be fatigued? I, I spoke to a, a Ukrainian cultural editor this morning. She said, we have no right to be fatigued mm. because as soon as we're fatigued, then we will all die. We'll be eradicated. So we have well, this, no right to do that. This is like I did want to ask you this question, and I I won't now. But I was like I wanted to ask you why it's so important for the average Joe that Ukraine prevail here. I was speaking to my in laws this morning, and you know, mother in law was saying, or my partner's mother was saying, oh, you know, thank goodness it's not on the t on the news anymore, as if like. I've only got the brain space to cope with this for a certain amount of time. Then I want to hear about something else. So it's it's almost this idea that that you know you can understand in mainstream media when they are a clickbait and that if they if they're not like a national news broadcaster, then they are dependent upon people engaging and clicking on their stuff. And so you either produce something new or something that's contrarian, and that gets people to to react, and therefore you're making your money. So you can understand it from that respect but like average joes are like 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 my kind of in-law they're going well I, i'm kind of bored of listening to that i want to hear something else yeah but but this is really bloody important so the question i wanted to ask you was why is it important why is it important to my partner's mother that ukraine prevailed and we can talk about the economic impact of that, yeah. but it's probably not enough time to answer that well i'll, I'll give a quick answer to that and this is going to be um you know, it is a simple one. I think our politicians have done a rotten job of explaining why this is important. Yes. Um, they have shied away from the fundamental truth that Russia has been telling its population they are at war with us and war with NATO. We do not consider ourselves at war with Russia and our politicians, for one reason or another, maybe because it's too hard, maybe because they have their own you know, issues, maybe they worry what the public think, have not been straight. They've not been straight that we are in an existential fight for our values and our system. Our wealth depends on it. Our future wealth depends on it. And they haven't spelled out what the price of that is. Um, and I really think they do need to be straight with us. You know, we need to be investing in retooling 
factories to produce ammunition. We need to be investing in innovation around drones. We need to build up our you know, mechanical warfare, our tanks and our equipment, and build up our physical armed forces again. And politicians just do not have the either the strategic vision or the backbone to be clear and straight about what's at stake. If they're able to explain to us how we would lose out, then people would start to care much more about Ukraine and go beyond just the humanitarian concern and, oh, isn't this terrible, to, shit, we're all in trouble here and we've got to dig into our pockets to win this and win this faster or the price for us could be huge in future. I, I think so. One of my biggest criticisms of the Biden administration has been not communicating how they value the equipment they're sending, which I think is they're not truthful with that. And actually, they said we're primarily giving a load of old stuff and all, all the stuff we give, we are replacing with newer stuff. And therefore, we're upgrading our own armed forces, so on and so forth. I, I, I think they're not communicating that well enough. They're just saying, well, we've just given $100 billion worth of stuff. It's like, uh, it doesn't really actually give the truth of what's going on there. There's so much more to that. And I'm consistently arguing about that. But also, there's no communication, like you say, to the public of like, this is why we're doing it. And this is why it's a benefit to you. And, and this is the return on investment we get for investing in geopolitical stuff around the world. Like this is this, the US is at the top of a global hegemony. And, you know, if we want to go isolationist and not get involved there, then we will lose out in the way that we influence the world. And you will lose out in, in terms of income from, uh, you know, hydrocarbons or whatever, you know, the cost of energy and so on and so forth. Like none of this has been like really like Biden get up and say like, this is what is, I mean, he kind of did it recently, eventually, but it's took like a year and a half. And that to me is a real shot in the foot. I mean, I'm broadly in support of the Biden administration and, and what they've been doing without them, you know, without the US, Ukraine would be screwed, of course, and everyone else in the EU and Germany now really coming up trance, but that communication has been lacking. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And it needs to change quickly because uh, we can't give Russia any space to rearm uh, and to uh, you know, every day that passes, um, people are being tortured, murdered, abducted uh, in the occupied territories, as well as dying on the front. Um, mm -hmm. And all those tens and tens of thousands of Ukrainian children who are kidnapped, many of them are now being put through military training so that Russia can uh, create another generation of uh, imperial martyrs. Um, yeah, there's no time to lose. Definitely. Well, look, uh, thank you, Jonathan, for your your really erudite expression of, of of what you feel and what's going on. Thank you so much to all the others, the, the AJ Simo for the JP Legend and Awesomeness Party Fighting Fund. This is a political party that I'm definitely starting. Or just bend it down the pub, uh, that too. Uh, sorry, I forgot the exact original party name. Uh, thank you to so much to AJ Simo, to It's Just... Uh, it's, just Avi, uh, Julian Roster, Saberint, Jack Ray, Paul Gilbert, and massively to SR USA 54. Thank you for your, your support of the channel and everything we do, I do. But also, as I say, go to Silicon Curtain, check out, I mean, I'm sure you already do, but check out Jonathan's work. It is exemplary. It really is. I'm jealous of the the, the absolute quality that, that, that he gets to, to, to put out the the guests he has and and what he says with them as well and I've I've been privileged to to get a piece of that here today. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Really do appreciate the time. Uh, would you be up for doing this at again at some point in the future? Because there's so much more to talk about. Definitely would do. Definitely. I'm an all all in for Ukraine. I've just started um, uh, guesting on the Maria uh, report as well, which some some of your right. audience will will notice. So. Um, it's at this point, it's whatever it takes. But also, this has been a fantastic discussion. You know, I tend to uh, react much better when I'm talking out loud. And uh, a lot of what I'm saying gets sort of created on the spot. Because, you know, I, I like that kind of live atmosphere. It gets the brain pumping, as it were. So yeah. definitely we should do this again.
Yeah, oh, thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, because uh, live is actually when you talk about editing, live is great because you don't edit. Like it, it's just there, and actually, th that's part of because I spend so much. I just and just don't have time, and so lives are actually easier for me to do. So I really appreciate you uh, uh, agreeing to do this. Thanks, John Larkin. Very kind of you. Uh, well, look. Uh, thanks again to Jonathan. Thank you for the incredibly uh, rich live chat going on at the side. So much, I'm sure that we weren't aware of. Uh, and please keep Ukraine at the top of your agenda. Please keep putting pressure on those who count uh, and those who you might not think count, like your friends and family and people you speak to on a daily basis. Keep it in the conversation, in the collective consciousness. Um, in the meantime, thank you so much. And last last words for you, Jonathan. Uh, just thank you very much. I mean, this is extraordinary. I'm uh, going to add you to my, my playlist. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, my, my core stream there um but this is this is great i see the comments coming up incredibly positive just thank you for that and thank you for everybody uh what they're doing and i'd encourage people to engage with their politicians go out do stuff join marches befriend ukrainians and uh, turn information into activism i think excellent well look stay on the line for a second in the meantime everybody toodle pips take care and i'll speak to you soon